Good morning, St. Paul's. It is good to have you all here. You are vocal, and that's good too. Uh, welcome those of you who are watching online later. We're happy to see you too, and uh, grateful that you're watching. It's a big day. Uh, traditionally, throughout the church, uh, it is Transfiguration Sunday. We're going to talk about that a little bit in the scripture today. Uh, it is also Racial Justice Sunday in the United Church of Christ. Uh, in our mission moment, we're going to hear more about that. And it's another uh, big day for a particular reason. I'm not one to recognize birthdays, but if there are big birthdays and round numbers, then I guess I am. I'm going to give you a hint why this is an important day. <laughs> 90 today, that beautiful lady turned. I'm going to break my own rule. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Betty. Happy birthday to you. There are cookies to celebrate. Uh, her birthday. Uh, they are actually left over from the bake sale that the Triple T, his bodybuilders, did last night. Here's the deal. As of present, they have sold $637 worth of baked goods. Yeah, that's great. The last time they got to $700. Just putting that out there. Uh, just putting that out there. 701. Uh, it would be a lovely number to hit. All of those proceeds go to help them fund their mission work food pantry uh, at White Oak. So thank you all for doing that and cooking those things. I brought a whole bunch of them home yesterday um, and, and they were all enjoyed. I think they're all done. Um, encourage you to get some of those too. Thank you to the folks who put on bingo last night. We had our Queen of Hearts bingo. Um, Good gathering, those are always a good time. Make sure you're around for the next one if you missed this one. Uh, there's a new newsletter out, came out last week. If you need a hard copy, they are in the back. Uh, they'll tell you everything that has gone on and will go on. And actually, Betty's birthday is in that document too, if you need to keep track of whose birthdays when. Um, there's a practice upcoming for the pinball tournament that is also upcoming. We got 16, it's a beautiful 16 person bracket. We're gonna reduce that down to a final four and then a champion. I'm told there's a nice prize. There certainly are bragging rights. There's an upcoming practice, and if you want to know more about that, Bill Barrett's sitting at the information desk, and he can tell you all about where and when uh, that's going to take place. We have a kids' event upcoming. To tell you more about that, I'll invite ministry assistant Dane Bogart forward. Hello. For the second week in a row, you have to hear me talk, and I apologize for that. <laughs> Next week, after church is over, Children's event, cookie decorating, It'll be fun. Any kid, kindergarten through fifth grade, lunch will be served. If you need to know a time, need to know a date, maybe you forgot the date, your bulletin now has it in there and the newsletter also has it in there. If you have any questions about it, come find me or call me or email me, I'm around. So any kid next week, Good. So, uh, because we are who we are, where we are, and what season of our life we are, grandparents, aunts, uncles, I need you to make sure there are kids for Dane's event to make cookies. Otherwise, him and I are going to be eating cookies for the next couple of weeks. Um, Valentine's themed kids event next Sunday. Between now and then, there's a worship service that I wanted to make sure you know about and invite all of you to. This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. The Lenten season begins. I know it's Valentine's Day too, but I'm sure that you're looking for a romantic way to spend that with your special person. Let me remind you of your mortality and put ashes on your forehead. Uh, actually, my wife suggested that I put hearts on people's foreheads this year. <laughs> which I thought was a good suggestion. So happy to do that if you want to celebrate uh, both things happening at the same time. Ash Wednesday, this Sunday, uh, our services throughout the whole Lenten season that don't happen at 10 a.m. are all at 6.30. So Ash Wednesday is at 6.30 p.m. Monday, Thursday will be at 6.30 p.m. Good Friday will be at 6.30 p.m. 
the sunrise service will be at 6.30 a.m. So I don't want to confuse you. The sun rises in the morning, so hopefully that's a good reminder. But 6.30 is the time for all of those services if they're not a 10 o'clock service like Palm Sunday or Easter Sunday. Hopefully that's helpful to remember. Are there any other announcements we need to make sure we make this morning? Whoa, the, uh, Whoa. Whoa. I didn't even think you were going to be here today. <laughs> I, I was going to call off, but I, uh, no, uh, anyway. I'm glad you're here. Let me make a, yeah, we had a very good week this week. Uh, met a lot of people, made a lot of contact with the, uh, with the residents of White Oaks and the neighborhood in general for uh, St. Paul's. Had a lot of new faces there. But uh, Dan and Bill Tierbuck came out, and uh, Larry uh, uh, Samples came out, and I said, "This, I mean, it's great to have the new guys come out there." We had 154 on Wednesday. Uh, had chili and cookies, and uh, we had 185 on uh, Saturday. We had pancake breakfast with sausage and stuff, and, and I hope uh, Dave gets feel better. He can continue helping us with the new to make it. I said, "I really like having you guys out." It's a, it's a great type of fellowship, you know, nothing else in there. We're also, you know, feeding, uh, doing God's work, the way we Jesus preached it, and that's what we want to, you know, represent. So, uh, great place to go. All right. I'm rounding a Wednesday's number up so I can tell you that we fed 340 people this week. Uh, 154 and 185 just is hurting my brain. Yeah. So uh, thank you for St. Paul's Kitchen folks, folks who volunteer, folks who give money to that, folks who pray about that. And thank you for being here to make that announcement. Well, <laughs> Are there any other, other announcements we need to make this morning? All right, seeing none, I will invite you to prepare yourself for worship today as we hear our prayer loop. Stand and join me in our call to worship. Life can seem shrouded in mystery. O oh Lord, lift the veil of our misunderstanding, that we may see your light. We are eager to serve. O oh Lord, calm our spirits and patiently prepare us for service. Look to the Lord for mercy and comfort. We look to the Lord for healing and hope. Let us pray together. The darkness of winter has been our companion, Lord. Now the days are lengthening. Bring your light to us, that we might see your glory, and may work for you, offering an hope and peace to this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stay standing and sing with me our opening hymn, number 297, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.
Please be seated. We have a new slate of council members, folks leading our church forward, and I would invite all of them who are with us to come forward <laughs> to the ominous sound of the organ. <laughs> Your fearless leader, Council President Lisa Huck, is standing here waiting for you to join her. She already got here second, and she's moving slower than usual. Here comes Rick. We're missing one. I don't know who it is by looking. Uh, oh, Tabby's not here. Serenity's sick. That's a prayer concern in a second. I get to ask uh, these folks some questions. I'm going to give you the answers, everybody. Don't freak out. Uh, as a way to install them for this year's uh, service on council. Dear friends, you have been called by God and chosen by the people of God for leadership in the church. This ministry is a blessing and a serious responsibility. It recognizes your special gifts and calls you to work among us and for us. In love, we thank you for accepting your obligation and challenge you to offer your best to the Lord, to these people, and to our ministry in the world. Live a life in Christ and make him known in your witness and your work. Today we install these eight folks to different positions, elders and trustees and deacons. This question is for you all. Do you this day acknowledge yourself a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I do. I do. Will you devote yourself to the service of God in the world? If so, say, I will. Amen. Will you so live that you enable this church to be a people of love and peace? If so, say, I will. Amen. Will you do all in your power to be responsible to the task for which you have been chosen? If so, say, I will. Amen. My friends, let us pray. Almighty God, pour out your blessing upon these, your servants who have been given particular ministries in your church. Grant them grace to give themselves wholeheartedly in your service. Keep before them the example of our Lord, who did not think first of himself, but gave himself for us all. Let them share his ministry and consecration, that they may enter into his joy. Guide them in their work. Reward their faithfulness with the knowledge that through them your purposes are accomplished through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Faith family of St. Paul's United Church of Christ, rejoice that God provides laborers for the vineyards. This question is for you. Will you do all you can to assist and encourage these leaders and the responsibilities to which they have been called, giving them your cooperation, your counsel, and your prayers? If so, please say, we will. My friends, your counsel for 2024. As those folks are making their way back to their seats, I'll invite any kids who are with us to make their way downstairs with Mr. Dane, and I think Kim's the storyteller today, to Children's Church. Well, I find my prayer concerns. There's a couple kiddos heading downstairs. Um, I meant to put Billy Lockhart in our prayer uh, concerns, and I just forget, forgot to give Dane that note, uh, so I'll lift him back up. I was given the note that Pam Siskel needs added, and she was. Uh, Ashley Kapler uh, still is trying to figure out what's going on, it sounds like, uh, with her, so we'll keep her in your prayers. Uh, as you heard uh, Rick say, Serenity is particularly sick, double ear infection, can't keep anything down. So Tabby asks for us to be praying for all of them. Um, I found out this week uh, Peggy Stevens has been having a rough go of things. I don't know a ton, but I'm going to reach out to her this week. Uh, but certainly she hasn't been with us for a few weeks. And it sounds like it's been dealing with quite a bit. So please keep Peggy Stevens in your prayers. I uh, found out end of the week that Charlie Rice is in the hospital. I'm going to go try to find him on Monday. Uh, but lift Charlie up in your prayers if you would. Uh, a reminder, we served just under 340 meals this week. So we thank God for providing that nourishment through St. Paul's uh, volunteers and support. Are there other prayer concerns we need to make sure we lift up this morning? Yeah, Kim. Yeah, so uh, you guys have been praying for Adam Hayden, who is on this list, and also in that same group of 
uh, uh, Indiana Kentucky Conference, uh, Dina Holland Neal is uh, a pastor up in Gary, Indiana, and she is battling bone cancer. She just found out. Wow. Dina Holland Neal is a pastor in La. Uh, Gary. Gary. I knew it wasn't Lafayette when I said it. And Gary, uh, battling cancer, uh, prayers prayers for her and continued prayers for Adam Hayden who we have in our prayer prayer concerns now. Are there others? I saw Sherry Andrews is here. She has a cane. But it looks good. I mean, it's not a bad, bad look. Barry's <laughs> Steve <laughs> <laughs> There's a rite of passage right there when you're borrowing your mother's cane. My hunch is you will be without a cane sooner rather than later. So we'll pray for that. Good to see you here. Are, are there any other prayer concerns? All right. What I'm going to do is let some silence fill our sanctuary. If there are prayer concerns you want to lift up to God and you didn't want to share with us, that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, that's what we'll do in that silence. Uh, for the rest of us, if you don't have a concern, just dial into the ones we have lifted. I'll do my best to lift these up for us, and then I'll invite you to say the Lord's Prayer with me. If you're unfamiliar with that prayer or not sure what words specifically we use at St. Paul's, it'll be on the screen, and it is on the back of the bulletin. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Gracious and loving God, we gather here this day with plenty of prayer concerns. Some of them we have vocalized and lifted up to you. Some of them we have whispered in our hearts in this silence. Some of them we dare not say, but you know we are carrying. There are several of us with joys too, Lord, things we are celebrating, good things we have experienced. You know what those are too. Those blessings come from you. So we gather here in this time to be honest with you about where our hearts are, to lift up to you those things that we know need your attention more maybe than others, to give you thanks for those blessings that we have seen and experienced. So this morning, Lord, we ask you to continue to be with Ashley Kapler, with Pam Siskel, with Billy Lockhart, with Peggy Stevens, with Charlie Rice, with Adam Hayden, with Dina Holland Neal, with Serenity and her family this day. We thank you for showing up at St. Paul's Kitchen and in many places where people were blessed this week by folks who gave up their time and of their talent and of their treasure to take care of some other need for some other person. We ask you to empower us and enable us and open our eyes to see more of those opportunities, God. And find ways where we can step in to moments that require your hand and your people, your presence. On this day, Lord, we look into the darkness that sometimes gathers in this world and we affirm that the light shines in it. That the darkness never overcomes the light. And we prepare ourselves to enter a season where we inch closer and closer to the cross and try to get our heads around what Jesus is doing there. How Jesus came to be hanging there. Why he accepted the responsibility of dying there. And we want to be honest in this season, Lord, and certainly be prepared by the time we see him on that cross again to own our shortcomings, to own our failings, to look within ourselves and figure out where the darkness lies and let your light shine into it so that we might become better at shining your light from us into dark places we encounter in this world. Bless this work. 
bless this day. We thank you for things to celebrate, like 90th birthdays and sweet people having them. We thank you, Lord, for things to celebrate this day, like a couple of kids learning stories about your word and about your promises in children's church. We thank you for a fellowship hall full of laughing, smiling people playing bingo. We are excited about the opportunity to gather and worship this Wednesday to hear about what your love looks like on a day we'll be celebrating the love you've given us. So be with us, God, in this day and in this service. Be with us in this season we are about to enter and help us to understand the gift you've given us in your Son. The light that shines through him that will never go out. The light that shines in us because of him. The love he's offered us. Empowered us with to share with others. We pray these words he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. At this point in the service, I would invite Kim Armstrong forward for a moment for mission. Kim. Thank you. Um, so I have my timer, so I don't go over time, and I wrote it all down so I don't get off on a tangent. So you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, today is a Racial Justice Sunday in the United Church of Christ. And uh, what is that and why should we care? Um, well, one definition of racial justice is this. When it comes to human rights, racial justice work means going beyond preventing individual cases of racial discrimination and combating structural oppression. It involves working towards systemic change and solutions. At the heart of this work lies the voices of people subjected to racial injustice and their experience of human rights violations due to systemic racism. When we speak about racial justice, we have no choice but to discuss racism and anti-racism, which is something that the national UCC does not shy away from. As you may or may not know, I've been involved in racial justice, anti-racism work for four years now, both on the national level and the conference level, Indiana Kentucky Conference. I've been trying to think about how to bring light to this important work in front of people, not just this congregation, but who probably do not think about racial justice or how racism plays out in our society and in our churches every single day. It's kind of like this. I don't think about electricity every single day. However, it plays a profound part in my life every single day, whether I think about it or not. So why should we, the church, care about racial justice? Well, I only have a few minutes here, so I'm going to let you know why I care and uh, how you, either as a church or as an individual, can also begin a journey towards caring about racial justice. First, most important, Jesus was a brown-skinned son of a lowly carpenter who went up against the Roman Empire in order to speak truth about his God for his people, and he was crucified for that. As Brian Stevenson points out in Just Mercy, if you've seen that movie or read that book, um, he says this, I believe that so much of our worst thinking about justice is steeped in the myths of rac racial difference that still plague us. I believe that there are four institutions in American history that have shaped our approach to race and justice and remain poorly understood today. Those four institutions are slavery, the reign of terror or lynching, 
Jim Crow, and mass incarceration. If we as Christians, and Brian Stevenson is a Christian, are unable to stand up, <laughs> are unable to stand up against the human rights violations that happen to our fellow humans, then maybe we are not doing the work of Jesus. And um, I would invite you to take another look at our call to worship today and, um, and talking about how lifting the veil of our misunderstanding so that we can see the light. I'll just leave it at that. Thank you for your time. And if you are interested in this work and want to know more about it, then I will be very pleased to talk to you. Thank you. Kim has worked very hard the last few years uh, as part of the Anti-Racism Task Force. We're blessed to have her as part of our congregation. So if that's a work that you want to be a part of, questions that you have around what it is and how it uh, has taken shape in our denomination, I'm happy to point you Kim's direction and happy that she's a part of, of our uh, faith family. At this point in our worship service, we take up a collection. That collection is us just owning the fact that the blessings we have come from God. And it's on you what it looks like to give a portion of those back to God. Uh, however that satisfies whatever deal you've made with Him. We set aside time in our worship service to do it because it makes a difference that our corporate body says, here are some of the gifts you've given us. We're going to use them to serve the world in whatever way God points us to. Let us collect our tithes and offerings this day. Will you join me in our prayer of thanksgiving? Everlasting Father, thank you that you are the light of the world, guiding our steps on your path. Your word says that the earth is yours and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to you. We recognize everything we have belongs to you. We acknowledge that our very lives belong to you. We now offer back to you a portion of what you have given us. May God the Father prepare our journey. Jesus the Son guide our footsteps. And the Holy Spirit watch over us on every path that we follow. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated.
Anybody know what that's a picture of in that sermon slide? Anybody? Yeah, Carla? View from the stage. View from the stage at the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville. Um, I picked that for a particular reason. I want to talk about what those moments are anyway, but uh, the Ryman Auditorium not only is a historic theater where the Grand Ole Opry uh, still uh, performs, but it has this stained glass wall. Bill, will you go to that next slide? If you sit in the back row, there's a whole uh, wall of stained glass behind you, both in the lower level and in the balcony. Um, I've seen uh, certain things televised there where uh, they, they plan them for when the sun's shining right through there. And it's pretty amazing. I, I wanted to show you this picture and, and talk about this because what I want to say in my intro is I've had some really holy experiences listening to live music. Not in churches. I mean, I've had a few in churches. But particularly, there's something about when a group of people all gather together around this one artist that they like uh, or this one set of artists that they want to hear. Uh, in particular, there have been some moments that only could have happened because I was in a live setting watching music happen. On my 30th birthday, my best friend and I went and saw Billy Joel and Elton John play Wrigley Field. And everyone in that stadium knew the song The Piano Man, and we all sang it together. And those two piano men were playing back and forth riffs, and uh, there's just something otherworldly about that. The, the, the only time I've ever gotten to see a show in the Ryman, I actually wanted to see the opening act, and some people who were there to only see the headliner were being very disrespectful of the opening act, and the headliner walked out and said, hey, he's certainly more talented than us, he's just not as famous yet. You should really listen to him. It didn't happen in a live setting. I, I watched uh, one time a concert where the Jumbotron didn't work and the artist got mad and stormed off the stage until it was fixed. It didn't happen in the video. You get an insight into people when you watch them perform live. For instance, and we didn't plan this, you might start a song in the wrong key and catch it. <laughs> and be like, this would be better if I play this in the right key. That doesn't happen when you're watching the canned thing. Something about being there changes the experience of the music that you are listening to. It happens in worship. It happens in secular uh, concerts. It happens anywhere where music enters. And for me, that's just the best way for me to get my head around it. I've listened to lots of songs. I, I never really stopped listening to music throughout the day, but man, is there something different about sitting and watching it get made in front of me. And, and that's the best window I have into what happens here on this mountaintop in this passage of Scripture. There's holy experiences that happen in places like that. Uh, when Kate and I first started getting serious, when I knew this was probably going to work, I convinced her to go with me to Seattle to the Gorge and watch a concert. The Gorge is this beautiful outside venue. It's literally overlooking a river gorge, and then there's music down the hill. It's so beautiful. And when she said, yeah, I'm game for that, I'm like, this is probably going to work. And when we had a great time, I thought, yep, this is definitely going to work. Uh, we, we went and saw Brandy Carlisle that night. We're going to go to, to D.C. and see Zoe, but mostly because Brandy Carlisle is playing there here in a month or so. I just, that's, that's my frame of reference for you. And if you're not musical, I don't know what to tell you. This will be harder for you to get your head around. I don't have a second example. But if you are, if you've ever been transformed by a piece of music that you heard live, a classical piece, a rock and roll piece, a rap piece, if there's ever been a moment where you're like, I've been transported just now, somewhere else. That, I think, is something akin to what happens in this passage of Scripture. And, and places that weren't holy become holy, whether they have stained glass and wooden pews or not. Whether you're sitting in grass looking over a, a river gorge or not. Whether the jumbotrons were good or not. Whether the, 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 the right key is played the first time or it's corrected. Whether you're expecting music to transform you or you're not, it, it happens. I think that's what happens on this mountaintop in this passage of Scripture. Will you pray with me before we read it? Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us in these next few minutes. We ask you to speak to us in these next few minutes. We want to listen only to you. 
So wherever your voice comes through this day, God, let us tune our ears to hear it. Wherever we are transformed in listening to this story about transfiguration, Lord, help us key into what it means for us. Help us to carry with us out of this place what that means for us going forward. God, let us hear your words this day and wrestle with your words in the days to come. Open our ears and open our hearts to receive that word and let everything else just fall away. In your son Jesus' name, amen. Scripture we're going to look at today comes from Mark chapter 9. We've been in Mark, but at the early parts, we're moving closer to the end, and you'll see why. Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9, read this way. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not want to know what to say. They were so frightened. <clears throat> then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. I want to highlight just a few things in this passage of Scripture. I meant to set an alarm a timer on my phone when I started this sermon. <laughs> I dropped the ball. Keith Smith keeps track of how long I go in worship, and I think I'm like... 12 minutes ahead for the year, so just hang on, folks. <laughs> Super Bowl's not till 5.30. <laughs> no, I don't have much to say. Because I think this is a really simple thing that happens in this passage of Scripture. I just don't think we see it very clearly very often. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured. That's not a word that we see terribly often. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could have bleached them. What we're trying to be told here in Scripture is that this is something otherworldly. This is something that couldn't happen if the only thing that's happening now are, are the earthly limitations of physics. Transfigured, changed in a spiritual way, in a powerful way. He became something else before their very eyes. Dazzling white his clothes became, whiter than any bleach could make them. What we are told in passages of Scripture is that they were illuminated. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Elijah and Moses have both been long dead. And so we can draw from this that what's happening is Jesus is connecting to heaven, still being on earth. It invokes these things that Jesus said about how he's that one that can go up and down Jacob's ladder. We, we addressed that a few weeks ago. It has very much to do with Jesus' purpose in this place. He's there on earth with these few disciples, but he's also somehow connected to heaven, transfigured before their very eyes, illuminated with the light of heaven, and talking to two very famous forebearers. Both long dead. And what do Elijah and Moses represent? Well, Moses is the founding father of the Jewish tradition. And everyone in this story is Jewish, including Jesus and the disciples. And so Moses very clearly represents tradition. What has happened to this people. And Elijah is the most famous and most revered of all the prophets so, so tradition is present and prophecy is present. Or another way to say what prophecy is, is what is to happen. And Jesus stands in the middle of tradition and prophecy of what has happened and what is going to happen. Stands in the middle of earth and heaven as only he can. That sight would strike fear I think in any of us, certainly in a good Jew like Peter, what am I looking at? That's Elijah and that's Moses and they're talking to my rabbi, to Jesus. 
And so he says, it is good for us to be here. And I think he means that, and I think it's true. But I think what Peter probably means is, it's good that we're seeing this. It's good that we're witnessing this. It's good that we get to watch this Lord. And then he leans in a particular direction and says, let us put up three shelters, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. That also is something that tracks in my brain as one way you might react to this scene, especially if you were scared. Let us worship tradition. And let us worship, worship prophecy. And let us worship you, Jesus, the one who brings it all together. Let us worship what has happened. And let us worship what will happen. And let us worship you, Jesus, who brings it all together. The mistake that Peter makes is he puts an equal sign between those three things. And man, do we make that mistake a lot of the time, too. I think we're most guilty of worshiping tradition, of paying so closely to what has happened that we have a hard time shaking it. And then some of us are wired the exact opposite way. I'm one of these. I'm so excited about what is to come that sometimes it takes me out of the present. I'm so focused on the future. Every once in a while, I miss the moment. I don't bask in it. I don't learn the lessons of it because I'm like, yeah, on to the next one. Some of you have seen this in me already. And, and, and so Peter does this very human thing because that's what Peter is. He's very human. He says, well, hey, let's, let's worship all three of you. Right here, Lord, that's what we'll do. We'll build a, a shelter for Elijah and a shelter for Moses and a shelter for you, Jesus. And he's saying this scripture tells us out of fear. And several of us, when we have to lean into tradition and we're future-minded, or when we have to lean into the future and we're tradition-minded, get real scared real fast. I've seen that in some of you. God clarifies the moment. If he was scared before, imagine how scared Peter and the other disciples must have been when this cloud envelops them. And from the cloud comes a voice that they understand instantly to be God's. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Some passages of Scripture, some interpretations of Scripture literally say, listen only to Him to make further the point that God is making from this cloud. And when they look around and the cloud dissipates, there is only Jesus standing there. Tradition has vanished. And prophecy has vanished. What has happened and what will happen are no longer present. It's just Jesus In this moment. And it's just the command from God to listen to what Jesus says in this moment. I've been in holy places. I've been in holy churches. I've been in two holy churches named St. Paul's United Church of Christ, in fact. So have most of you. But, but I've also been on car rides by myself when the right song came on as the sun was going up or coming down. And that was a holy place for me. I've been in rooms where everybody was singing a song that we all grew up singing. And that was a holy place for me. I've had some conversations with people that I love that became holy. I've had some conversations with strangers that were holy. There is this thing that can happen to us in our human experience where all of a sudden... Something spiritual is taking place that we did not foresee. And I think what this passage of Scripture is trying to get us to do in those moments is listen for one voice. And it's not the voice of our experience or our expectation. It's not the voice of what was handed to us and our best traditions. Nor is it the voice of what we might be and what our future looks like. It's the voice of Jesus. That's who God points us to. That's who God says we should listen to. 
And the fact of the matter, a lot of times, we choose to listen to a lot of other things and a lot of other voices and a lot of other people. We try to build shelters to other things that we would lift up and make equal to God. I'm not going into them, but I suspect if you watch the Super Bowl today, you'll see lots of examples of things that people try to make equal to God. I'm not trying to ruin the game for you. I can't not watch it though and go, hmm. Mm, I, don't know. I don't know if that's the most important thing. Here on this mountaintop, just a few disciples get to go with Jesus and they see him transfigured. They see him connect to heaven and light up. And then they see people from heaven talking to him. And not just any people, really notable people, important people to the tradition that these disciples all followed and carried and were learned. And, and then all of a sudden God says, no, 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 listen to him. My son, whom I love, listen to him. What Peter says is right. It is good for them to be there. But why Peter thinks that, I think, is wrong. And God clarifies it. Here you have a chance to listen to Jesus. And you should. <clears throat> we, we gather in these holy places sometimes for the purpose of connecting to God and, and worship like we're doing now and several other people are doing in other churches now. Sometimes in places like the Ryan Auditorium because the band we like is going to sing. And I wonder how often we go into that going, you know what I want to listen to and I only listen to in this place? is Jesus. Let me tell you how hard it is for a pastor to say Hey, you should probably not listen to me. You should listen to Jesus. I pray that prayer before every sermon purposely because I don't want you to ever think that you're here to learn from me. You're here to learn with me on my best days. We're all here to hear Jesus. And I've got it wrong if there's a day you come here and you don't hear Jesus through the words that I have prepared. And you've got it wrong if you walk out of here and you hear something that somebody besides Jesus said. We've both done it. Historically. We'll both do that in the future. What worship ought to be is us going, I'm going to set aside that time aside and I'm going to be with Jesus and I'm going to open up myself to receive a word from Him. I'm going to listen only to His voice even though the world is full of so many other voices and those voices all have different agendas. Those voices all have different perspectives. Those voices all have different things they're trying to get us to do. But if they say something that's counter to the teaching of Jesus, to the message of Jesus, to the life of Jesus, you've got to learn how to stop listening to them. Stop giving them power and place and priority and preference. And most importantly, you've got to stop repeating them. Because you're adding to the noise that's taking away from the words of Jesus. I don't know when this became so hard, but I know that it is for several of us. On a day when we remember that Jesus was transfigured and heaven was connected to earth. On a day when we lift up that, that, that tradition was present and yes, also the future was present. That, that Jesus somehow was singled out amongst those, that he connected those and we should listen to him. On, on a day when we are preparing ourselves to enter into the Lenten season, I wonder what it means that this thing happened on this mountain for those disciples. And Jesus, as they're walking down, says, don't even tell anybody about this till I'm risen from the dead. And can you imagine how scared they would be after hearing that? Do you think that there was this moment post-crucifixion or maybe post-resurrection where those disciples were reminded of that voice in the cloud that said, you should listen to my son. You should listen only to my son. Can you imagine 
that there were days around Jesus' crucifixion and after his crucifixion, even after his resurrection, where lots of people had lots of opinions and none of them were Jesus speaking any truth. Thank God there was no social media back then. What did this mountaintop experience mean for the disciples and what does it mean for us? Well, probably there's a lesson in listening only to Jesus. That is spoken through the ages and through this passage of Scripture and is being spoken in almost every church that celebrates transfiguration today. But I want to leave you with this last question on this last Sunday before Lent. What did this moment mean for Jesus? This transfiguration, this encounter with Moses and Elijah, and yes, his Father in heaven before the eyes of these two disciples. What did it mean for Jesus? James Talmadge in Jesus Christ, the study of the Messiah and his mission, according to Holy Scriptures, long title, says the following, and it has me thinking and will have me thinking as we move toward Ash Wednesday. Our Lord's descent from the holy heights of the Mount of Transfiguration was more than a physical return from greater to lesser altitudes. It was a passing from sunshine into shadow, from the effulgent glory of heaven to the mists of worldly passions and human unbelief. It was the beginning of his rapid descent into the valley of humiliation. Here on this last Sunday before Lent, we see Jesus illuminated, shining because he stands between heaven and earth. That his destiny isn't to stay on that mountaintop illuminated. It's to descend into the depths of all that earth can be and be covered in a darkness. That's what the Lenten journey is that we're about to begin. We're trying to get our heads around what it means that this brown-skinned son of a carpenter stood up to the empire of his day and was killed for it. And I'll just remind you as we begin that journey that what God says in the midst of this transfiguration is that that man, that that son, that that child of God is the one we should be listening to which was always tricky, but has become increasingly tricky in a world of another empire. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. You will know when you are getting this right. That's one of the things I can give you as a bit of good news as I close here. You'll know when you're getting this right when there's a moment and you're not sure what to say and then suddenly you say some words that you didn't know you were planning to say and someone goes, oh, I totally get that. And you'll go, oh, man, that is just God speaking through me. It happens. You'll know when you're getting this right because you'll be surrounded by people and suddenly you'll all know the words to the same song. That's what it feels like anyway. You'll know when you're getting this right when you're living into the lyrics of the song that we've already sang. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strange. In the light of His glory and grace. Amen.
I'm going to turn my microphone off for this next singing. Will you stand and sing with me our closing song? are going to get a little darker than they are today. This day we stand and see Jesus illuminated by the heavens. And in this moment, we are encouraged to carry that light into the world. A light that the world needs now as much as ever. May God open the hearts of the people that you encounter. And in meeting you, may they see the light of Christ. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.